Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. On this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we visit several states across the country to get management tips from Merck Animal Health. Stay with us. NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen starts now. And now, a special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. This week, we're looking back at some of our favorite stories from around the country brought to us by our friends at Merck Animal Health. Let's take a look. Cattle producers put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into making their operations successful. The last thing any of them want to deal with in their herd is respiratory disease. It's a significant animal health issue and costs producers an average of $15 per calf per year. That equates to a billion dollar problem for our industry. Cattlemen and Cattlemen reporter Brian Baxter heads to South Carolina to see how one family operation works to prevent calf respiratory disease. We're a family operated Angus seed stock operation. We uh, run about 900 brood cows on 2,500 acres. We also have a herd of commercial cattle. Our primary purpose for existence is to produce Angus bulls for the commercial cattle industry. And pretty much everything we do revolves around that and trying to create a total picture to produce bulls that'll go out and work for people that'll be trouble free and um, go out and produce the type of cattle that the industry needs today. Kevin and Lydia Yan run a family owned and operated Angus seed stock outfit in Ridge Spring, South Carolina. The Yans take a lot of pride not only in raising top quality cattle, but also in their customer service. It's very important to us that the cattle when they leave here go perform and do well for their new owners. And we want to do everything in our power to make those cattle perform well. With their livelihood riding on producing healthy cattle that meet their customers' high expectations, the Yans can't risk a respiratory disease setback in their herd. I can just imagine from a cost standpoint, from a reassurance standpoint, to be able to tell our customers that everything's under control and that the health is good and then to know that we've had a respiratory outbreak would really be a problem for me to be able to stand behind our cattle. Cattle are, are how we make our living and, and um, we need them to be healthy and we need them to perform and, and we have scale, sales scheduled twice a year and we need cattle to sell. A respiratory outbreak would be very detrimental. Keeping their herd healthy and profitable means doing everything they can to prevent respiratory disease. Kevin and Lydia say a good overall herd health program is the foundation to a successful operation. We don't have a problem, we don't want a problem, and we don't want our customers to have a problem. Our goal is to sell bulls to people that go out, work for them, that make them want to tell their neighbor, I got this bull, he's great, I had not had any trouble with him, I'm going back to get my next one from there. We have a very um, stringent herd health program here at Yon Family Farms. We work very closely with our local veterinarian, Dr. Jeff Norden, scheduling and, and um, mapping out our, our herd health program throughout the year. It takes a, uh, a team approach and you have to uh, break it down in components and, and work out a good game plan in order to successfully manage it. Every year their game plan includes a strong vaccination program to ensure their cattle are protected from respiratory disease from the very beginning. Well, the vaccination program is the critical component of a herd health program. Without a good vaccination program, without a good vaccine, you're probably doomed from the start. I don't think that you can really overemphasize the importance of a good vaccination program. A respiratory vaccine is just the basis of what we do. They work. When we wean cattle, we don't need to, to worry about a respiratory blow up. And when we use good products and do it in the proper manner, we haven't had problems with respiratory disease. The basic respiratory diseases that cattle need to be vaccinated for are IBR, BVD, type 1 and 2, BRSV, PI3 or parainfluenza 3, and then Manheimia hemolytica and Pasteurella multocida. 
The Yons use the Vista line of vaccines as part of their vaccination program and fortunately have never had to address any respiratory disease setback in their herd. We want our cattle to, to be billet proof when they leave here. We've used Vista, been very pleased with the results. It has worked well. This is a very good choice for respiratory vaccine because it offers the most complete protection on the market today. And it's also one dose, so it's not a vaccine that has to be boosted every time. And it's the only vaccine that's on the market that is modified live for the virals and an avirulent live on the pastorella portion. Vista is a good vaccine. I think you need a vaccine that's certainly efficacious. You need a vaccine that has a long duration of immunity. You need a vaccine that has a low reactivity rate. And you also need one that's cost efficient. It could just be really devastating if you did have a respiratory outbreak. And fortunately, we have not been in that situation. And I attribute that to the fact that we've had such a good prevention program and that our vaccines have worked and been effective. The Yons rely on Vista and Vision not only because they effectively prevent respiratory disease, but also because they're less stressful on the cattle. We vaccinate calves at three to five months of age, and then again two to three weeks prior to weaning to, to get that um, immune response, getting those cattle ready to, to be weaned using just Vista once and Vision at weaning. After we vaccinate calves, we don't see the calves go through what we would think of as a typical stress period. They, they still seem pretty much just like they did the day before you worked them after you've run them through the chute and vaccinated them, done whatever else, tattooing or whatever else you were doing to them that day. When we look at respiratory protection, what we're actually trying to do is immunize the animal against the threats that it's got to meet, but we don't want to immunize it with a vaccine that's gonna cost us so much in production and Vista appears to be a very mild vaccine, as you heard Lydia say earlier, they've seen no stress from the vaccine. A comprehensive vaccination program is just one component to preventing respiratory disease. A strong nutrition program, starting with calves nursing soon after birth to ensure they're getting colostrum, is critical in order for the cattle to respond effectively to the vaccines. Colostrum quality is, is most important. We know that a calf just needs to get up, nurse, and, and hopefully he's going to have a very high quality colostrum, but we feel like nutrition and a, a good herd health vaccination program improves the quality of that colostrum. When we vaccinate, we think the fact that we have taken care of them from all the other standpoints makes that whole vaccine process easier on them and the vaccine work effectively. Despite the best vaccination and nutrition programs, calves can still pick up viruses and contract pneumonia. Dr. Newcomb says observing the animals on a regular basis is important to diagnosing and treating the disease early. It's important because respiratory disease can, can, can travel pretty fast between the animals. So once you start seeing one or two animals, you'll start seeing the whole herd start getting an outbreak. Once an animal contracts respiratory disease, that can affect his production throughout his lifetime. The Yons know that with any program, it takes many components working together to be successful and effective. While a strong vaccination program is important for ensuring the overall health of the herd, they say it's just one piece of the puzzle isn't any one area that is going to make our herd more productive. It's, it's the genetic component, it's the nutritional component, it's the herd health component. Parasite control is the basis for having a good herd health program as, um, as cattle with parasites aren't going to respond to the vaccines and, and get the immune response that we're looking for. It's a system that it takes all of them done properly for our herd to be Productive. They all work together as pieces of the puzzle. If one component of the puzzle is missing, then we have an incomplete product to sell. So we try to fill in all the blanks and, and put all the pieces together that can help us create a product that's trouble free for our customers. If you look at nutrition, you look at parasite control, you look at stress management, those are all the foundations that you have to build a herd health program on. You want to minimize stress, you want to maximize the calf's immunity, and you want to maximize the calf's nutritional status. And when you vaccinate, you want to use the most complete vaccine out there on the market today, and that's going to be Vista. Caring for their cattle and staying up to date on their herd health program is a way of life for Kevin and Lydia Yon, and it's a quality that many people take notice of. Kevin and Lydia, they're, they're go-getters. Uh, 
They pay attention to detail. They go the extra mile. They grasp uh, new concepts and, and that they're willing to change depending upon the market conditions. We've just been entrusted to be stewards of the cattle and the land and we take that very seriously and uh, we feel very blessed to get to do it every day. We get to see better scenery and more miracles every day than you know most people get to see in a lifetime. It's just what we love doing and I hope we get to do it for a long time to come. Reporting from Yon Family Farms in Ridge Spring, South Carolina, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. To learn more about the Vista and Vision vaccines from Merck Animal Health, visit our website at cattlemen to cattlemen.org. We'll be right back. Respiratory disease is a significant animal health issue in the beef industry. It costs producers nearly a billion dollars in lost profits each year, and it's the most prevalent disease in calves older than 30 days. So why not prevent respiratory disease before it steals from your bottom line? Vista Once protects your calves with the most complete respiratory disease coverage available, and Vision Blackleg vaccines can add 14 pounds per calf at weaning. For further information, contact your local veterinarian or animal health supplier. When it comes to versatility on your operation, nothing beats a John Deere D-Series skid steer. They're not only great for cleaning and feed chores, but with John Deere Worksite Pro attachments, you can tackle just about any job thrown your way. You asked for versatility, and John Deere delivered. These rock-solid machines are built to last. See your dealer today. I'm an NCBA member. I'm an NCBA member because NCBA, they look at the facts, they look at the history, and they look what's good for the industry. It's important to be NCBA members just because of what NCBA does. They keep us informed about a lot of things that are going on. The reason we're an NCBA member is we think that it's the best voice that the cattle people have. We think without the NCBA, why, we'd be in hot water back in Washington. I think the staff at NCBA and uh, the way they're structured do a tremendous job of representing me in Washington. I'm an NCBA member because their policy is based on sound science and common sense. Join me today. Join me today. Join NCBA today. Head to BeefUSA.org or call 866-USA-BEEF. Welcome back. In 2009, the USDA National Animal Health Monitoring Survey found internal parasite resistance to a popular class of cattle dewormer in seven different U.S. states and suspected resistance in eight others. In March of 2012, the FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine held a public forum to address the growing concerns of internal parasite resistance to popular cattle dewormers. To learn more about internal parasite resistance, why it's important, and how producers can manage this growing problem, we caught up with our friends at Merck Animal Health to talk about effective parasite control strategies for cattle producers. Cattlemen know that effective internal parasite control is the cornerstone of every animal health program. Using the right product at the right time is critical for maximum production. Parasite control is so important to cattlemen because parasites do three things to animals. They decrease the feed intake, decrease average daily gain, and they affect the immune system. This can amount to about 190 bucks over the lifetime of that animal. The other thing is they affect every segment of the cattle production system, whether it's the cow-calf guy, the stalker guy, or the feedlot guy. These animals have to deal with these parasites in every part of the production cycle. Eldon Fry is the owner of a custom preconditioning operation near Quitman, Arkansas. Eldon says the key to his business is getting cattle healthy and ready for their next home. We've been preconditioning cattle since 1999. We were Before that we were a cow-calf operation for about 15 years prior to that. Spring of 99 we converted over, sold the cows and became preconditioning a lot. We get in anywhere from seven to 10,000 a year. We keep cattle 45 to 60 days normally. Do all of our vaccinations, dehorning, castrate bulls, ID, 
get the cattle healthy and ready to go west, either to grass or to the feedlot directly, depending on the size of the cattle we get in. Fry says being in the cattle business is a way of life that suits him. I'm in the cattle business because it's a way of life that I really enjoy. It's something I've, I've been doing for 30 years, and then from the dairy business to be in the beginning to the stock, you know, to a beef cow operation. We had registered cows. Uh, our son got into showing cattle. It's a perfect place to raise your kids. It's just a way of life that I really love. I like to take care of the animals. We really enjoy doing it. For Eldon Fry, controlling internal parasites is an important factor in the entire animal health process. Internal parasite control is important because these cattle are stressed. When we get cattle in on initial work, and we're using Safeguard Wormer along with our vaccines. We use a, a five-way IBR BVD. We uh, use a, a pastorilla. We black leg the cattle, and like I said, we use Safeguard. So we're going to vaccinate them with a five-way. You sure want it to work. You're spending the money on the vaccine, and you want that calf to do it. So worming him on the first day and cleaning him out with Safeguard seems to me like works faster and gets that calf to where his immune system can have be able to work and help that calf. Dr. Newcomb describes the science that links internal parasite control with a properly working immune system. What we know is that when you deworm an animal, then you're getting rid of the worms. And what we've seen is that the excretions and secretions of the worm are what's causing an altered immune response. So an animal that's heavily parasitized may not be able to respond properly to viral vaccine or viral disease. But when you kill that worm, then in about a 14 day period, the body is able to reset itself and respond properly with a proper immune response to your viral vaccine. Eldon Fry definitely sees the effect. I'll definitely see a difference after worming. And worming cattle and getting them parasite free sure helps the vaccines work a lot better, I think. You get your immune system up. Optimal internal parasite control has become more difficult as resistance to a popular class of cattle dewormer available in poron and injectable forms has been documented and identified in many states. Deworming protocols have changed in recent years because of resistance, okay? When we think about what's gone on, say, over the last 40 years in the cattle business with dewormers, in the 1970s, it was the brown stomach worm, okay? Uh, Ostratasia was the biggest, the baddest worm on the block. But when the avermectins or the ivermectin compounds came onto the scene, that parasite was basically handled. But over the years, what we've seen, especially with the advent of the poron dewormers and then the generic dewormers, we've seen those, those products kind of used and abused somewhat. And that's led us down the path of resistance because these products are being used at times of year when they don't need to be used and they're used for fly control when they're actually dewormers. So what's gone on through the years, we've had this selection process, especially in the South, for a worm called Coperia. Dr. Newcomb says Coperia resistance to Avermectin class dewormers was first documented by the U.S. Department of Agriculture on an operation in Wisconsin with cattle purchased from the southeastern U.S. One of the first cases of parasite resistance recognized in the United States was up in Wisconsin, which would seem kind of odd. But what the guy in Wisconsin was, was a stalker guy. And what he did was he bought cattle in the south. They were overwintered in the south, and then they were moved up north to Wisconsin. But while they were in the south, basically they were dewormed pretty regularly, about like every 60 to 90 days with some form of poor on dewormer. So when those cattle traveled up north, they carried every parasite that was in them or left over from those dewormings up to Wisconsin. And what the guy in Wisconsin had actually found was that his production level was going down. And then US, he contacted USDA. They got involved. They did fecal samples. They harvested some cattle, looked at the worms, and they found the predominant worm in those cattle was Coperia. Newcomb says new research sponsored by Merck Animal Health confirms that these avermectin-resistant Coperia can have a significant impact on cattle performance. Back in the dark ages when I was in school, Coperia was thought not to be a problem at all, but we've done some recent research where we've seen that that particular parasite, especially like operation like that Eldon has, it can cost you up to uh, a quarter of a pound a day in gain and up to a pound and a half a day in dry matter intake. 
Newcomb State's research shows that once resistance develops to a class of dewormer, parasite resistance occurs with every product and form of that class of dewormer. Once the, the worm gets resistant to one of those classes of dewormers, it's going to be resistance to everything in there. And, you know, recently there's been a lot of hype that it was generic versus name brand. That it really doesn't matter that once they get in resistance, they've got resistance to everything in that particular class of dewormer, whether it's brand X or brand Y, whether it's generic or trade name, they're going to see the same thing. The parasites will be resistant. Dr. Newcomb says as important as an effective deworming is to the performance of cattle, cattlemen need to know their dewormer is effective. Well, the producers need to make sure whatever dewormer they're using is effective. And what they can do is take fecal samples on the day that they deworm, and then again uh, 14 days later. What you want to see is about a 90% reduction in that egg count. If you don't get a 90% reduction in egg count or greater, then you've not had a successful deworming. And you need to go back and ask yourself a few questions. Number one, was the product administered correctly? Was it administered at the correct dose? If those two can be answered yes, then you need to start thinking about you might have a resistance problem and contact your veterinarian or, or parasitologist for help. To prevent resistant parasites from multiplying and spreading to an operation, Dr. Newcomb says producers can use different classes of dewormers concurrently to minimize and manage parasite resistance. Well, producers need to do to manage the parasite burden is basically clean the cattle out. Like if you're a stalker operator, you want to make sure that you kill all the worms in that animal as it comes into your operation so you're not carrying resistant worms or distant population of worms onto your property. The best way to do that is to use like Safeguard because Safeguard kills within 24 hours. The other thing you want to do too is to add that in combination with one of the macrocytic lactones, one of the avermectin type compounds because when you do that you're getting the best of both worlds and you're protecting each compound from resistance developing. Dr. Newcomb says the strategy of concurrent deworming with two different classes of compounds was developed, tested, and proven in Australia. The modeling to show that, that the combinations work, that work actually started in Australia. What their model showed was that by putting the products in combination and using them at the appropriate time, you could actually extend the life of these products for several years. The other thing that they found, and, and, and the model did predict this, is that the amount of resistance or the amount of number of resistant worms would go down by using the combination products. And over several years, that seems to have been proven out that the model was correct. Newcomb says the concurrent deworming strategy has also proven to be a worthwhile investment in trials in the U.S. feedlot industry. On the four feedlot trials that we've done and are published, what we found was that there was about a 10 to 1 return on your investment by using the combination of a macrocytic lactone or ivermectin with Safeguard, okay? And that was four or five years ago when cattle prices were much less than what they are today. Newcomb says cattlemen can see the benefits when they use this deworming strategy in their operations. Well, three things to remember about strategic deworming is number one, it reduces parasite burden on the pasture. Number two, it will improve the health of the cattle. But number three, and probably most importantly, it will put more money in your pocket. Eldon Fry agrees. The one thing I want cattlemen to know about using a deworming product is that they will see results. They'll see weight gain. They'll see the cattle perform better. The product will pay for itself. Reporting from Quitman, Arkansas, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. With cattle values near record levels, a successful deworming program is more critical to cattlemen now than ever before. Merck Animal Health encourages you to work with your local veterinarian, parasitologist, or animal health provider to develop an effective deworming strategy. If you'd like more information, visit safeguardcattle.com. And we'll be right back. At Merck Animal Health, we are dedicated to improving the health and well-being of animals through innovative science-based solutions, products, treatments, and services to ensure a dependable, affordable food supply. From cattleman to consumer, from farm to family, we're with you every step of the way. 
We work where you work. What drives you drives us. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. Hi there, I'm Joey. And I'm Rory, and welcome to our farm outside Nashville, Tennessee. When we go to work, whether it's on tour or here at home, we wear the West. That's right, where it's that perfect snap shirt or that perfect pair of boots. When you wear Roper, you wear the West. Learn more about us, Joey and Rory, and about Roper Western wear at eroper.com. Telling the truth and being real And feeding my family a home-cooked meal That's important to me That's important to me And planting the garden and watching it grow you're not responsible for the weather, just the cattle. And Rangeland works as hard as you do to deliver performance, production, and profitability. Cattle need consistent nutrition. They'll get it year-round with Rangeland products from Lando Lakes. Deliver what they need free choice in weather-resistant loose minerals and mineral and protein tubs. Get the most out of your forage. See your Lando Lakes co-op for products that will stand up to whatever Mother Nature throws at us. Weather's coming in. Rangeland. Consider it done. Like past generations, today's cattle ranchers are continually looking for ways to create value on the ranch. But there's an ever-increasing concern for ensuring that practices on the ranch are not just profitable, but sustainable as well. Reporter Matt Fleck shows us how one California rancher views sustainability and how it's a lot more than just being green. Head southeast of Sacramento, California, and you'll find Dwayne Martin Livestock. We're a cow-calf stalker operation, uh, run cows and calves in California in the foothills in the winter, and then we go to summer pasture in Oregon, Nevada, or the Valley of California. The Dwayne Martin family also has cattle on feed in Colorado. The Martin series of operations have been in the making for more than 45 years. I started when I was about 23 years old. I was driving a ready mix truck and I decided I'd like to have a few cows and I'd been born and raised on a dairy so I was familiar with livestock and came home when my dad was retired and had 20 beef cows and came home one day from work and uh, told him I'd like to buy his cows and, and rent his little ranch that he had and he said yeah that'd be fine he says that's three thousand dollars for the cows and that's if you have the money well, I surprised him I had the $3,000 and I bought his cows and, and that's how I got started. And through that time, the Martins have learned a few things about surviving in the beef business and say caring for the land through efficient, sustainable production practices is the key to success. We focus on three things. Preserving the environment on these ranches so, because that's where we make our living is, is on Mother Nature. And if we abuse her, she's not going to take care of us. The other thing is utilizing the resources as efficiently as we possibly can, produce the most beef per acre that we, we can, and then obviously being profitable. A lot of people just focus on the environment only when they're talking about sustainability. We t believe in uh, focusing on beef improvement technology. You know, there's more, more than one way to reduce your carbon footprint in this world, and we believe by being more efficient with the limited resources we have, that that's our way of reducing our carbon footprint. As long as we can do this and still produce a safe, quality, affordable product for the people like we always have, that's what we have to do. Another part of being sustainable? Constantly analyzing the practices in place on their operations to ensure efficiency. We're always um, analyzing and evaluating the ranch and feed yard, everything we're doing there, always looking at more beef improvement technologies like implants. They're a great asset to us for very little cost. We can produce more beef per acre on the limited resources we have. And uh, as long as we can produce a safe quality product, uh, we have to use everything that we have access to. Dr. Chris Reinhardt is an extension beef specialist at Kansas State University. 
He identifies simple, sustainable management practices for ranchers that bring value and profitability, all the while producing a safe, quality product for consumers. Implants have demonstrated for several decades now the ability to, to produce more beef off a given unit of, of pasture, a given unit of feed resources. And so from a sustainability standpoint, they definitely can contribute from that standpoint. Improvement technologies, like implants, are used to supplement or compensate for missing hormones found naturally in an animal's body. Hormones are, are a fact of biology. Hormones are, are present in virtually all living systems, but most importantly for our discussion, in all mammals and in all cattle. What we do with the implants is simply try to, to increase or, or replace uh, the hormones we may have removed in the case of a bull calf where we remove the, the primary source of androgen, testosterone, we, we want to replace that to optimize growth out here on pasture and also in the feedlot. Again, hormones are a, a normal and a necessary part of growth and we're simply augmenting what's already there naturally. The proper procedure for using implants is that they're placed in the middle one-third of the animal's ear, just beneath the skin. Within a matter of hours to days, the, the, uh, the incision heals uh, and, uh, and the implant begins paying out uh, almost immediately. Dr. Reinhardt says research shows implants add real value to an animal and ultimately a rancher's bottom line. Implants add pounds, pounds of lean beef production. Uh, implants increase the size of the animal at the end of any, any phase of production. Implants increase the size of a suckling calf at weaning time by 20 to 25 pounds. Implants will increase the size and weight of a stalker calf by 20 to 30, 35 pounds, depending on the resources. Implants can add as much as 120 pounds uh, to the final weight of a feedlot animal. The thing that really brings it home for me is uh, that we're increasing efficiency of our total production system and we're really using a technology that's already in existence in the animal and we're just optimizing it for production of beef. In a cow-calf production system we can expect something on the order of 20 or 25 extra pounds due to implanting which increases 25 extra pounds of saleable weight. Without the use of that implant, um, we may receive a slight premium, but based on studies, economic studies that have been done in the last few years, the incentives to not use implants are not nearly great enough to compensate for that extra 25 pounds of weight. Implants are a huge uh, benefit to our bottom line. In order for us to stay competitive, we have to take advantage of everything that's out there. If the next guy is going to do it, then we have to do it. And uh, you know, people that are not taking advantage of the the implants, the technology that we have, they're costing themselves money. And the bottom line is, we produce pounds. We pay our bank with dollars per head, not cents per pound. A common misperception is that implanted calves won't respond as well in the next phase of production. But research shows that's not the case. The question often comes up about subsequent performance of calves that might have been implanted either as a suckling calf or as a stalker and the subsequent performance effects uh, of being implanted or not implanted in the, uh, in the feed yard and really the data uh, would suggest that there really is no negative impact of a previous implant on their future performance. High quality affordable beef that requires less land and resources to produce. Proof that beef improvement technologies play a major role in sustainable agricultural practices and feeding the world. When we can produce 25 more pounds of calf on the same resources, that's putting more food on the table for the American people and, and, and the people we export to in this country. And, you know, Socially, that's kind of our responsibility to produce as much food as we can with the resources we have. If we do something to where we're producing cattle on a, on, on a ranch that, and we're not maximizing each animal, then we're not doing our job. We've had implants now for over 50 years in the marketplace. 
Uh, we've been experimenting and looking into ways to improve the utilization of, of implants. The implants have been proven not just safe, but effective at improving and increasing the amount of lean beef production uh, per animal, per cow, and uh, also improving the efficiency of our industry. Reporting from Ione, California, I'm Matt Fleck for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. This story was brought to us by our friends at Merck Animal Health, a research-driven company that develops, manufactures, and markets a broad range of veterinary medicines, including, of course, the Relgro and Revelor brand of implants. For more information, visit relgro.com or cattlemantocattlemen.org. Respiratory disease is a significant animal health issue in the beef industry. It costs producers nearly a billion dollars in lost profits each year, and it's the most prevalent disease in calves older than 30 days. So why not prevent respiratory disease before it steals from your bottom line? Vista Once protects your calves with the most complete respiratory disease coverage available, and Vision Blackleg vaccines can add 14 pounds per calf at weaning. For further information, contact your local veterinarian or animal health supplier. To stay up to date on beef industry news and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, check out BeefUSA.org. You'll find news on both the Federation of State Beef Councils and the work of NCBA on Capitol Hill. Plus, link to NCBA programs like the blog, Beltway Beef, updates on the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA trade show, and the latest from NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Connect today at BeefUSA.org. New Holland is smart for the way you farm. And New Holland round balers are smart for the way you raise cattle. By focusing on making the densest bale possible, New Holland round balers pack more into each bale, saving you time, fuel, and money. Now that's smart. We can also match your feeding requirements with a variety of bale slicing, cutting, and wrapping options to help maximize your time. Plus, with models designed specifically for silage or specialty crop harvest, New Holland gives you the power to make smart choices to fit your farm or ranch. You work hard to get the most out of every hay season to benefit you and your cattle. From mower conditioners to balers and tractors, New Holland has the right solutions to help you make quality hay and forage for your cattle operation. Visit your New Holland dealer to learn more about the complete lineup of New Holland equipment, in addition to all the benefits available to cattle producers. Welcome back. Pink eye is one of the most common assaults on the health of calves less than four months of age. Pink eye losses can exceed $100 per incident in beef cattle. As pink eye season approaches, it's time for producers to take preventative steps to control this contagious and costly disease. Reporter Matt Fleck has more from Central Florida. Each year, pink eye losses cost the U.S. cattle industry $150 to $200 million. Pink eye is a disease every cattleman can recognize and every cattleman wants to avoid in their animals. Well, if we're looking at more oxella bovis, we look at pink eye, we can suffer a lot of economic losses from it. And one of the most easy ways people see this and manifest it is lost weight gain. And per animal that has pink eye, we can see lost production of 40 to 60 pounds per animal. Now the tough thing is a lot of people out there, they'll see pink eye and one of the things they'll see is damage to the eye. And when they see that eye damage, if they go to sell that animal, that can cost them upwards of $11.75 per hundredweight when they go to sell it. When we look at lost production to pink eye, you know, we know we got the average daily gain of 40 to 60 pounds per head per animal, the damaged eyes. What that all equates to is about $100 per head you can look at. And that's been documented in studies. Dr. Bennett Flanders says when the right environmental conditions come together with large numbers of flies, the rate of pink eye can be quite high. Our biggest challenge here recently, the last year or two, has been pink eye. We've had, you know, I'm a veterinarian and I've been in practice for, was in practice for 35 or 40 years and I had the worst pink eye I've ever seen in my life right here. Pink eye in cattle starts with a trauma to the cornea of the eye caused by dust, pollen, 
ultraviolet light or flies. Once the cornea has been irritated, Maraxilla bovis, the primary bacteria cause of cattle pink eye, attaches to the eye. So when we think of Moraxilla bovis organism, how it attaches to the eye, just take a look at your hand and think of your fingers as that organism and your hand. And when it comes down on the eye, it attaches on the surface of the eye with those fingers. So it'll attach there and you'll have multiple organisms like that attaching. And when those organisms attach, we get more irritation to the eye. We have the Moraxilla bovis organism there. And we start seeing the clinical signs of pink eye. Stewart says if left unchecked, pink eye can develop rapidly to a severe level that threatens the animal's eye. So if we're looking at an animal that has pink eye, we can go through some various stages, the infectious process. First thing you'll notice is an increase in the tearing of the eye. And you're going to notice that by some staining coming down the medial canthus or the corner of the eye on the inside. And it'll come down their face and you'll see a nice wet area. It might be a little dirty looking and things like that, but excessive tearing there. Then we'll get some redness in the eye, conjunctivitis with that, we'll see. Then that can just spread. We can start seeing maybe right around the cornea area a little bit of an ulceration, a little integrity break of the cornea there. It can get white, and then we can start seeing it spread. And people will worry, when they start seeing it like that, they worry about losing that eye, losing that. And then you can see scarring can be one of the end resolutions, that we have a scar in that eye. And as we said, that's when you know we don't want to lose the eye. Sometimes the scarring will heal up and they'll be fine. But as we talked with those purebred animals, if we get a permanent scar or a blue eye, as some folks will say, or a white eye, you've lost, you know, that value of that animal. Every cattleman can recognize the disease once it develops. What cattlemen really want to know is how to prevent pink eye. Dr. Stewart says preventing pink eye requires a three-pronged approach. When we're looking to prevent pink eye, we have to take an approach of a three-legged stool. And what we're looking at, each one of those legs is vital. Just like if you're sitting on a stool, you don't want one of them weak because the stool can collapse. So we think of a pink eye program, think of that three-legged stool. The first leg we look at is prevention. And when we're looking at prevention, we're talking about, let's use a broad-based, broad-spectrum vaccine that's gonna give us protection against multiple strains of Moraxella bovis. Because that Moraxella bovis organism is the one we gotta prevent. Stewart says timing of a vaccination program is as important as the vaccine itself. Pink eye is hard to treat, so we really want to prevent the problem. And one of the first things we need to do is get those animals vaccinated. And when we vaccinate them, we want to get them vaccinated three to six weeks prior to the onset of the pink eye season. As I tell folks, let's look out six weeks, because most of these products that we have, it's going to take a good six weeks, three to six weeks to build a good strong immune response to that vaccine. Unlike other vaccines, which produce circulating antibodies in the bloodstream, Stewart says pink eye vaccines produce antibodies that bathe the surface of the eye to fight the infection where it starts. When we look at our pink eye vaccine, we vaccinate that animal, like we said, three to six weeks before the onset of pink eye season. We build up a good immune response in that animal. How that animal's immune system combats the pink eye or, or the Moraxella bovis organism is, they shed tears, and they shed in those tears, we have antibodies in those tears, and they bathe and they coat the eye. And there are antibodies in those tears that combat that Moraxella bovis organism and keep it from attaching to the eye. And that's the key with that vaccine. If we've got those tears in the eyes with those antibodies, we combat that organism and we minimize economic damages due to pink eye. While vaccination with a broad spectrum vaccine is important, Stewart says fly control is equally critical in preventing pink eye. The second leg of that stool is fly control, and that's critical also because the flies are the ones that spread that Moraxella bovis organism. And uh, those face flies can go from animal to animal transmitting that bacteria. So we gotta have good fly control, and that starts be it in the cow, be it in the calf, but every animal in the place. We wanna use insecticide ear tags that are effective against face flies. We might as well get one that's got effect against horn flies because horn flies are also a problem. But we want to put one tag in each ear of these animals, so two tags per head. And we want to use a poron, and uh, poron insecticide also, same time we put the ear tags in. So a good way to think of it for the fly control is a tag and pour program. While both horn flies and face flies can cause pink eye, face flies can rapidly spread the disease from animal to animal in a herd. So we talk about that face fly, we know that it transmits that Moraxella bovis organism to one animal. And we've used that example today of how, you know, what happens, the progression of the disease. But keep in mind, that face fly can land on one animal, 
take that Morax elebovus organism to another animal, and we see that in herds all the time. I mean, so you know flies, we got a lot of them out there, and that's why we want to control them, because they're the vector, they're the ones that spreads that organism from animal to animal, so they land around the face, around the eye, as they're landing, they're transmitting that organism. And if you've got cattle that got fence line contact with a neighbor, you've got herds on both sides or close to you, we can get face flies going from one herd to another. Dr. Stewart says the environment can also contribute to the incidence of pink eye. The other part of that three-legged stool is the environmental control. And when we're looking at that, what we're looking at is we got pastures that could be long, high. We want to clip them because we don't want grasses, weeds, etc., like that, scratching that cornea of the eye and setting up the animal for the infection. Because if we damage the integrity of the eye, that Morox elebovus organism can really get in there and take effect when those flies land. Ultraviolet light, things like that, you know, it's, we can't put sunglasses on them, but we can sure create shades for them. Dust, things like that, pollen, realize that can activate it. So when we look at pink eye, we look at that three-prong approach. We want to have a good vaccine. It's going to get us good broad-based protection. We want to have good fly control, so we want to use a tag and pour. And we want to have good environmental control to control pollens, dust, high grasses, things like that. Dr. Stewart sums up the three-pronged approach of a complete pink eye prevention protocol. So if I'm looking and I have somebody contact me and they say, what's a good pink eye program? The first thing I'm going to tell them is we got to vaccinate. So get that good broad spectrum vaccine into that animal three to six weeks before the onset of pink eye. Tag and pour. I want insecticide ear tags that are effective against face flies. I want a good long acting pour on insecticide on the animal. And I want to be aware of the environmental control. To clip the pastures. Keep in mind if you might have to put up shades, things like that. But keep in mind the impact the environment can have. That should minimize any losses due to pink eye. For Dr. Flanders, a pink eye prevention program involving vaccination, tag and poor fly control, and environmental management is producing positive results. But we seem to be getting ahead of it now. Reporting from Lakeland, Florida, I'm Matt Fleck for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. For more information about preventing pink eye, please visit StopCattlePinkEye.com or, of course, cattleman to cattleman org. We'll be right back. the official monthly publication of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. The National Cattlemen is produced exclusively for NCBA members and includes coverage of the news and events affecting our industry. From Capitol Hill to the far side of cattle country, the National Cattlemen provides information NCBA members need. Every issue includes market analysis, feature stories, and practical management tips. Start receiving your copy of The National Cattlemen. Call 866-USA-BEEF or go online to beefusa.org and join today. Seasons change, but year in, year out, year round, it's Crystal X season. With specific supplements, for weaning stress in fall. Protein for pre-calving in winter. Calving in spring. And minerals and fly control in summer. For low cost per head per day supplements, every season is Crystal X season. Let's face it, you don't think a lot about your trailer hitch. You use it and forget it. We understand, but at B&W, we think about it. Short nights, long hauls, never-ending chores. The unthinkable. We think about it all, so you don't have to. B and W. Trusted. There's a hundred years of history, and a hundred before that all gathered into thinking going on beneath his hat. And back behind his eyeballs and pumping through his veins is the ghost of every cowboy. 
that ever held the reins. Freckles Brown might pull his bull rope. Casey Tibbs might jerk the flank. Bill Pickett might be hazing when he starts to turn the crank, plus Remington and Russell looking down his buckhorn sight. All watching through the window, this cowboy's eyes tonight. And standing in a catch pen or in chute number nine is the offspring of a mountain that's come down from olden time. A volcano waiting quiet till they climb up on his back, rumbling like the engine of a freight train on the track. A cross between a sheep bear and a bad four wheel drive with the fury of an eagle when it makes a power die of a snake who's lost his caution or a badger gone berserk. He's a screaming, stomping, clawing, rabid, mad dog piece of work. And his partner in this madness that the cowboys call a game is a ton of bucking thunder bent on proving why he came. But the cowboy never wavers. He intends to do his best. And of that widow maker, he expects of him no less. And when you get down to the cutting, the leather touches hide, and there's nothing left to think about. He nods and says, outside. And frozen for an instant against that open gate is history turned to flesh and blood, a warrior incarnate. And while they pose like statues in that flicker of an eye, there's something almost sacred. And you can see it if you try, it's guts and love and glory, one mortal's chance at fame. His legacy is Rodeo, and Cowboy is his name. Turn him out. This is Baxter Black from out there. Well, that does it for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. We'll see you right back here next week on RFD TV.